Well, we are a, a church family, and you know we have a staff that is part of the family as well. And as we've been talking about work over the last couple of weeks uh, in this series, uh, three-week series, like I reminded you, started with Ephesians chapter six, verse five to nine, and now uh, today we're going to be continuing that and talking a little bit more about work. But uh, I want to play a little game with you, okay? And you all are part of the game, and this game is get to know our church staff, and the jobs they've had in the past is a game, okay? So I'm going to ask a question, and the possible answer is going to come up on the screen, and then I want you to get your uh, fingers ready. It's just like, you know, one, two, three, four. There's four answers, so pick whichever is one, two, three, four. Get it ready. As soon as you see the question, you figure out what the answer is, and it's just, you know, there's no prizes or anything. It's just judging ourselves. (laughs) All right, you ready? Here's the first one. Eric Rodriguez worked on a movie about talking dogs. What is the name of the movie? Paw Parazzi, Snow Buddies, Lenny the Wonder Dog, or Paw Patrol? Got your questions locked in? All right, ready? The answer is Paw Parazzi. (laughs) Paw Parazzi. Okay. Which pastor in our church was a door-to-door meat salesman? Pastor Jason? Pastor Jay, Pastor Mo, or Pastor Eddie? Lock in your answers. Put them up high. You got your answers? It is Pastor Jay. Hard to believe. I mean, it is so hard to believe that when he said, and this wasn't even the first thing he shared when we were talking about these jobs. It was crazy. All right. Which of our staff members worked as a chocolatier? Edward Bird? Andy Tamelio, Ali Hansen, who is leading worship today, or John Collado? Put your numbers up. Ready? The answer is John Collado. He had a business. I think he said it was called Covered or something like that. Anyway, we're hoping he'll do some of that for us here. Chocolate covered <laughs> treats. Which of these jobs did Pastor Will have? A denim expert? A transcriber? a security guard, or an archery instructor? Lock your answers in. Pastor Will was a terrifying security guard. Hard to believe that he worked as a security guard. All right. What kind of company did Pastor Eddie Rivera own? A publishing company, excavation company, a mortgage company, or a bread company? Lock your answers in. The answer is a mortgage company. There he is. Okay. Which staff person worked as a gymnastics instructor? Was it Rachel Boone, Pastor John, Katrina Coe, or Pastor Jason? Lock in your answers. Who was it? Put them up high. Let's see. This is going to be, this is going to shock you. <clears throat> I could not believe this. I, couldn't, I could believe Pastor Jay going door to door as a meat salesman more than I could believe this. Well, I hope you had fun seeing some of the jobs. Every job that we listed there, somebody on our staff had done it. All those other answers, it's crazy, the things that we've been a part of. Well, honestly, as I think about work, I didn't have a great theology of work until after I became a pastor here. It was really, you know, probably about 10 years ago, I started thinking about this idea of work. Um, I would say that um, when I got into full-time ministry 23 years ago, um, like most people, I uh, just thought that ministry was now a vocation. You know, I'm just going to now work and I will get paid, but I didn't think about even my ministry as work in that sense. It's just a strange dichotomy that I experienced. Well, until full-time ministry at the age of 28, work for me was just an ends to justify the means. I needed money to survive. I needed money to eat, to travel. I needed to pay for a car. I needed money to, for clothes, for medical uh, needs, and to save for an engagement ring. That's all that I needed money for. But I never really looked at work through the eyes of God. And you also probably don't always think of your work as glorifying God. When my son Josiah was starting to work two years ago after he graduated, I didn't ask Nathan this question, but I'm sure the answer would probably be very similar. 
I asked him, uh, do you look at your job, what you're trying to find, as a means to glorify God? And he said, no, I've never really thought of it that way. I've thought of it as what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to continue on, and this is the next step that we have. He didn't think about it because I feel like the doctrines of man have really influenced us where we separate the secular and the sacred, and really we're supposed to incorporate everything under the authority of God. Some people think that the spiritual matters only belong here in community groups or in church or when you're serving the Lord. And I believe now that our work is supposed to be worship to God as well, supposed to be glorifying God. And so today we're going to get an opportunity to study a little bit theology on work. And we're going to go through several passages in the whole Bible. Your whole work, your work in the marketplace your work to, at home, taking care of your children, all of these things, anything that you do, nine to five, or whatever hours you work, all of those things are supposed to glorify God. Most of you here are in ministry. I mean, everybody here is in ministry if you're a follower of Jesus. And most of your ministry takes place in a workplace. It's just the way it is. We have to keep you know, plumbing open. We've got to keep arteries moving. We've got to keep computers searching and processing and doing whatever jobs that you do. And I want to challenge you that your work also is supposed to glorify God. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So let's understand work and how God created it. The title of the message today is The Glory of God in my work, the glory of God in my work. By way of reminder, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. We started in Ephesians chapter one. You know, some churches, it'll, they'll preach Ephesians in like, you know, seven, eight weeks. And for us, it's been a whole year because we've slowed down over time. You know, we get to a part and we'll take a couple weeks to go for a deeper dive. And this time we're in a deeper dive. We went Ephesians chapter six, verse five to nine on bond servants and masters, and we applied it to us as employers and employees. And so for three weeks, we're focusing on this idea of work. Ephesians, it's really about our identity in Christ. As I remind you today, uh, this book I read by Watchman Nee broke it down into three categories. Sit, walk, stand. Sit in the heavenly places. You are saved because of Jesus. And because of that, you sit with him You will be sitting one day, but you sit with him. You are seated. You have this position in Christ that nobody can take away from you. But then we don't just sit. We walk. Our relationship with God, it influences the way that we live our life, and we walk with Christ. We walk in our marriages. We walk in our parenting. We walk as we love one another. We're walking, applying the word of God, and then we're going to get to stand in just a couple of weeks. Sit, walk, stand. We're still in this idea of walking And one of the places we walk is in our work. The first principle that we want to consider as we think about our theology of work is this. Work is established and modeled by God. Work is God's idea. From the very beginning, God has shown that he is a worker. If you go to the first book of the Bible, chapter 1 of Genesis, you will see that God was working right from the beginning. God established it. And he's modeled it for us. He is described as a worker. In Genesis 1, the vision that God has to create this beautiful world, the artistry, the imagination, the creativity, all of it done and described as work. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, a lot of verses are going to come up on the screen. You don't have to flip in your book, you know, in your Bible. You can just write these references down. We want to show them to you. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, it says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God established it. God models it. God is a worker. He is not lazy. And he inspires us and challenges us. God worked to create the universe like an artist with his hands. Notice Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. It says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers. When you look out in the starry skies, I want you to picture God placing those stars in the place that they lie. He is an artist. The moon and the stars which you have set in place 
What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? And even if many people don't acknowledge it, think about this. Psalm 19, verse 1. My wife is a speech language pathologist, and she says this is one of her go-tos. She brought this to my attention. Listen, the heavens declare they're speaking the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. See, God is at work. The heavens, the sky are proclaiming it. But not just the stars, not just the heavens. We also, you, are part of God's work. Notice Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. For you formed my inner parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Psalm 104, 24, if you're still not convinced. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And just like a worker today, he works hard. He gets a day off. God worked for six days and then took a day off to rest. And just like a worker today, he gets a performance evaluation. But his performance evaluation isn't after 90 days or one year like we go through. His performance evaluation was right after he created it. After the day was created, it created And the only person who could do a review for God was God himself. You know, when we do a review, it'd be great if I could review myself. Just be like, yeah, I did great. Check. (laughs) I have five out of five, 10 out of 10. I'm awesome. Give me, I'm going to give myself a raise. That would be great if we could do that. And I think all of us would probably think more highly of ourselves. But the only person who could evaluate the performance that God had is God himself. And so after he created, he said, it was good. 10 out of 10, day after day, it was good. You ever feel like that after you do a hard day's work? Whatever it is that you're doing, maybe you close a deal, you take care of a patient, you finish a job, you know, doing your hardwood floors, whatever it is that you do, and you look back as you're walking out of that house, as the patient is leaving, you're saying, it was good. I did a good job today. See, work is established and modeled by God, and we are called to be workers as well. Jesus also modeled the importance of work. In heaven, Jesus is involved in creation. John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We could also go to Colossians chapter 1. I don't have it on the screen, but Colossians chapter 1, it says that all things were made through him. He holds it all together. See, this is Jesus, the image. Man, God made in the image, sorry, Jesus, firstborn of creation. God's own image right here on earth. That's Jesus, and he created it. But not only in heaven, Jesus models the importance of work on earth. Mark chapter 6, verse 3, they say this. Is not this the carpenter, known by his profession, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. He was known as a carpenter, a worker, a builder, someone who worked with his hands. He had many titles, right? Rabbi, son of God, Messiah. What other titles would Jesus have had? Any others come to mind? Prince of Peace, Holy One, Lord, Savior, Carpenter. Of all the titles that God had here on earth, some are heavenly, pointing to his divinity, and some are pointing to his human nature as well. He worked. He was known as a carpenter. A carpenter would have been strong, would have had to work with their hands. You know, Ed Kasdorf, he's a carpenter. He works in the parking ministry, and his hands, they're rough because he is working with his hands, and he's strong. I've seen him carry lumber in here by himself because he is strong. I picture Jesus like that. He worked. He modeled it in heaven, but he modeled it here on earth because it's a universal principle. It's how the world works. I've talked about justice as a universal principle. See, the justice of God is a universal principle. That's why we feel when we are treated in an unfair way, it rises up in us. That's why the justice of God demanded that somebody should die to pay for the sins that we committed. We're so thankful that it was Jesus that died, a universal principle that we experience ourselves. And this is a universal principle as well, that work was created by God. It's modeled by God. And you are called to work. You're called to work. 
Now, there's a misconception that work was a result of the fall. Have you guys ever heard that before? The idea that we work is a result of the fall. Now, that's a misconception because work was created before the fall. I want to show that to you in the Word of God. The fall of man made work harder. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when Eve and Adam took of that fruit, at that point, that's called the fall, theologically, the fall of man. At that point on, work became hard. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But the fall of man is harder, but God called us to work. Genesis 2.15, before the fruit, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. They were supposed to work. The first command, the first command in the Bible, I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments, the first command that God ever gave. You can look it up. I looked it up again. I had it in my notes, and I want to make sure. So I looked at the first couple chapters, and this is the first command to human beings right here. Genesis 1, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue it, work, subdue it. It involves work. And even when people don't acknowledge it, when they're working, I want you to think about just somebody even in your workplace who's like an atheist or agnostic and they think you're crazy. You're going where? You're going to what on Tuesday night? They think you're crazy because you follow Jesus. They are fulfilling God's command, even though they don't know it. See, because this is the universal principle. It's modeled and established by God himself. But work became toil after the fall. Work became hard after the fall. Genesis 3, 17 and to Adam, this is the punishment that comes. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Thorns and thistles sweat after the fall. It became hard to work after the fall. Before the fall, everything was great. You worked it, but it wasn't so hard. Now it's like you go in to grab the fruit and it's thorns. It's cutting your arms. You're feeling it. Maybe you don't actually work with your hands in that way and your thorns and thistles are people. And you're like, yeah, I got a thorn. He's my boss. Or I've got a thistle. She reports to me. You know? Whatever it is, they're is difficulty now in work, and that's the way that it is after the fall, thorns and thistles. The glory of God can be manifest in my work. It's a starting point for our theology. I want you to see the foundation of it is that God established work. Next thought on work here, hard work is wise and commended by God. Hard work is wise and commended by God. I could have gone to so many different parts of the scripture to find these thoughts on work. We could have a 10-week series on work because it's all over the Bible, but I just want to focus on a few areas that I thought were very good to teach us and help us. And you young people, especially those of you that are in high school and college and thinking about your careers, I want you to listen. I'm going to share some things very personally with my own journey in my career, my walking with God, and my learning how to be a good worker. But Proverbs 6, this is our text today, Proverbs 6 verses 6 through 11. Hard work is wise and commended by God. The writer here says, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Now, there are words in the Bible that are used that we don't even need a dictionary for because they sound like what it is. And some of you chuckled when you heard the word sluggard because even if you don't know a full definition of it, you know what it is. You just think about slug, slow, lard. Probably not a good thing to eat a lot of. Slug guard, 
It's a very descriptive word, sluggard. A definition of a sluggard is a person who is habitually inactive or lazy. The thing that God does not want for you, church, is to be a sluggard in your work. So he says, sluggard, go to the ant. You lazy person, go and look at this tiny creature, the ant. It's so funny, I was just reminded at our engagement or wedding, my father-in-law, he was a zoology professor in India, and so he studied these things, and he talked about insects at our <laughs> engagement or our wedding. What was it, our engagement? I don't know, but it's interesting. So whenever I read about ants and things, I think about my father-in-law who is no longer with us, but go to the ant, he says. So let's look at the ant here for how we can work wise and how it's commanded by God. First, the ant is self-motivated. The ant is self-motivated. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise without having any chief, officer, or ruler. There's no chief organizing the efforts. There's no, ma- there's no person commanding out the orders. Without any leadership, they know what to do. They just do what it is that they're supposed to do. Go to them. The motivation comes from them being an ant. The motivation for their work comes from the fact that they are tiny creatures and they need to figure out how to survive. And so they are self-motivated. They don't have to do like we talked about last week from Ephesians chapter 6. There's no need for eye service. Let me only work when the chief ant is here. I can work because I'm created to work, and you should be self-motivated in your work. Are you a sluggard? I'm not going to have you put your hands up. (laughs) Don't point, don't nudge, just keep your hands to yourself. Oh, sluggard, if you are the sluggard here today, go to the ant. Are you a sluggard in your schoolwork, kids? Are you a sluggard in your housework? Don't nudge, parents. Don't nudge them. Just let the conviction of the Holy Spirit come upon them themselves. Are you a sluggard? Go to the ant. Look at this tiniest of creatures and get some instructions. Go to the ant. There is no supervisor. They just do it. Some people, they only do work when the boss is around. The boss comes in and you grab a piece of paper. (laughs) You're like, oh, yeah, I was just getting up. (laughs) What's on the paper? Um, I don't even know. You know, it's just a paper. You look, know how to look busy when people are around. But don't be like that. Oh, do your work as unto the Lord. Glorify God as you work. And we will honor the Lord. It's wise and it's commended by God. Look at the ant, O sluggard. She prepares her bread in summer. The ant is a good planner. The ant is a good planner. She prepares her bread in summer, they're doing what they're supposed to do so that when there is no food, they are prepared. They're planning. If you want to be good in your work, whatever it is that your work is, if it's school, if it's an entry level job, if you're a professional, you have your own company, if you want to get better and better, you should plan. Plan. Be a planner. I write things down. I write them down on pieces of paper. I take notes. I use my phone. Sometimes I'm at dinner, like, or wherever it is. People laugh. You know, I'll just say, remind me to, and I'll just put a reminder because I need to write it down. Be a good planner. Use tools so that you can plan. Uh, I'm going to show you a tool that I use, and it's, uh, this is a journal. This is my, um, this is Tuesday, May 4th. I looked for one that didn't have any personal information on it. But this is a technique I got from a book by Cal Newport called Deep Work. And he didn't lay out exactly what to do, but he just gave a principle and I started to apply it. So what I do when I get to the office here, I lay out my calendar. I write down on a sheet of paper and I write down all these sections, 30 minute increments, and I write the things. Look, that day, Tuesday, May 4th, I went to lunch with Rich Karpinski. I had a meeting at two to three with Jason Akers, but I had some time in the morning in the Word of God, Psalm 56. I wrote some notes down there. A little later, if there's a line between it, that's something else that God put on my heart later in the day. Uh, I don't know. There's some other things there that are hard to read, but this organizes my day. Before I start my day, I have it in my phone. I know what I'm supposed to do, but when I have a visual representation of it right there on my my, uh, desk, it keeps me focused. I can plan. I can organize Everything that I do is in my calendar. 
It's all there because I need to plan. I don't want to miss an appointment. I don't want to miss um, following through on something that I've told someone I'm going to do. So I mark it down. I plan. I prepare. And I want you, especially you young people, as you're starting your careers, be planners. Be self-motivated. Be planners. And then next here, and gathers her food and harvest. The ant, look at the ant. They get good results. They get good results. Self-motivated, good planner, good results. They have food when there is no food to be gotten because they've planned. If you can be people like this, self-motivated, able to plan, and also able to do this that we talked about, you will see that you will get some good results. But what happens to the sluggard? Verse 10, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. A little sleep, a little slumber, all these talk about laziness and sluggards, and poverty is going to come upon you like a robber. A robber comes when you don't expect it. A robber comes for you when you're walking in the city and they come at you with a gun like an armed man. You don't want an armed man coming at you. When an armed man comes at you, you're going to be fearful. You're going to be afraid. You don't want that to be there. This is what's going to happen to you. A little sleep, a little slumber. If you're a sluggard, you could be in great danger and great peril like an armed man. The Bible clearly states that we're supposed to be active and engaged in our work. And if you don't work, the Bible says you won't eat. Work hard. Work hard. Do your work as unto the Lord. Now, even if you are at a job you don't love, and I know some of you are at a job you don't love, I want you to work hard. For you younger workers here who are doing something that you may not be crazy about, I want to share a bit of my story. This is a, my first professional job and how I got it after college. So these are lessons. I've just called this lessons I've learned. I got four lessons that I've learned, and you younger people, you take a note here. This has been my journey, lessons I have learned. First lesson that I learned, and I learned this right away, as soon as I graduated, was have a vision. Have a vision. Have a vision for something. I was 23 years old, and I had a vision, and that motivated me to work. Now, my vision wasn't to glorify God. My vision wasn't to make an impact in the world. My vision wasn't something grand. It wasn't something that is, um, you know, going to change the world. You know what my vision was? My vision had a name. Her name was Susan. That was my vision. That was my motivation. I lived in D.C., and she lived in Chicago. I needed to get to Chicago. So whatever it took, I'm going to get to Chicago. 23 years old, I'm only interviewing jobs in Chicago. So I... I'm focused on this. And you're like, that's a terrible vision. I think my kids would say wrong, different. <laughs> they're, they're thankful for the vision that I had, and I had a vision. Do you have a vision for it? Maybe for you, it's something you want to do down the road. You want to own your own company. Well, get into a company first. If you have a vision, even if it's grand, you can get to that vision, but there may be some stepping stones that you need to reach first. And so you have a vision. I got a degree in business and finance, so... The top of my resume, that's what I put, to get a degree in the marketplace using my finance degree or something like that. I don't even think you put objectives on resumes anymore. This is how old I am. And so now, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, I had that as my objective. I'm going to get a job in finance. Second lesson I learned, use your connections. Use your connections. I've used my connections at every job that I've gotten. It was always through a connection that I had. It was a person. It was Somebody who saw me work and they put in a good word for me with someone who had power to hire me. Use your connections. When I left D.C. and I wanted to come to Chicago, I flew into Chicago and I had four interviews lined up. All four of these were from one connection that I had at my job when I was in college at an insurance company. I was a telemarketer at an insurance company and because of that, my boss, he liked me and... Um, I got that job because my friend, his dad owned the company. 
And so when I was a high school student, I said, I need a job. I'd like to get a job, you know, in, in a business kind of job. And so I got this job. And so this is my first job. And so um, he recommended me for four interviews. I came out here and I went to these different four interviews. Um, two of them were really bad. You know, two of them were really bad. One was pretty good. Um, but one guy was not having it. It was at CNA Insurance here in the city. I got, I think Susan probably dropped me off and I went up, you know, had a tie on and I had to wait a little bit. So I had my Bible with me, just going to read. And I went up to this top floor, this executive's office, a beautiful office looking out. I was like, I'd like this office one day. And so I used my connection. I sat down for this interview. And in this interview, he asked me, what's your long-term goal? And I said, you know, I think I'm thinking about ministry one day. Like, I'd like to get into ministry and things. And he asked me a question. He goes, is that a Bible in your hand? And I said, yes. He said, well, my first piece of advice for you, let me coach you a little bit. Don't bring a Bible to an interview. It's very divisive. So I said, am I getting the job? <laughs> Door closed, you know. It was cordial, but that was it. I never got a call back. And I went back to D.C. and still in the vision. This was probably like April, May or so when I came out for that, maybe during my spring break. I'm not sure, but I'm interviewing. I'm trying to get a job. And then I get a call that one of the people I interviewed with here down in the city of Chicago, they had a job open. Customer service representative just gave notice. I was the first call. He said, uh, you, you interviewed well, and I'd love to have you come. And so I said, yes, no offer letter, no promises, anything. I didn't even know what the salary was because it landed with my vision. So I took it, $20,000 a year, customer service representative right here in the city of Chicago. I got health insurance. I got a small studio apartment right down where near where Michael Allen was pastored, Uptown Baptist off Sheridan. I had a little studio apartment. It wasn't the best, but it was enough. And I, I had enough money for that. I had enough money to pay to buy a car and pay the loan. I had enough money to start saving for this engagement ring. I had enough money occasionally to take Susan out on a date. I mean, this was, life was awesome. And I was on my journey. I was on my career. These are some lessons I've learned. Have a vision. Use your connection. Use your connections. Work hard. Work hard. I loved that first job. Not because of the things that I was doing, but because I was needed, I could check off the box, and I didn't have to take any of that work home. I wasn't at home reading up on insurance and finances. I could just use my gifts at the church that we were serving at, Chicago Martha Mary Church, just serve faithfully. It was like funding a ministry, and it was awesome. And you could see how my vision, even though it wasn't fully formed, my vision was forming because God had prepared a place for me to work. Have a vision. Have a vision for something. Use your connections and work hard. Work hard. Do extra. Do more. I didn't just, I've never just done the bare minimums in any job I've ever had. You know, I'm, I'm sharing these things, not to see, oh, look, you're, I'm sharing these things that I want you to hear. If you want to get promoted, if you want to advance, if you want to make the next step, work extra hard. If you're a nine to five job, here, young people, let me just give you a little clue. Don't leave at five. 505, 506. Just leave a little bit later. If you're a time clock watcher, people know it. Oh, they're here till five and they're gone. Yeah, I know that's really what's required. I'm just giving you a little bit of clues, some things that people see. Did you stay till 530 one day because you just needed to finish the job? Work hard, do more, go extra. I had this customer service job. I was filing. I was calling. I was, you know, doing claims. I mean, it was not exciting work. But I learned how to use a spreadsheet. We were typing all of these letters. I couldn't believe we were typing out these letters. And it was a form letter. We would put this in a typewriter. You guys know what that is? You can ask. <laughs> Just ask your dad. Just ask for a typewriter. I put it in this typewriter, and I would type, and it said, dear, on a photocopied letter, dear, and I would type in Jim. This looked terrible. So I was like, let me figure it out. So I got Word, Excel. I created a spreadsheet. I put the names, and I did a mail merge. I showed my boss, hey, what about this? And he said, that's awesome. And so then he would stamp. The other thing that was terrible was a stamp signature. I said, can I get your name? He goes, yeah, put it in, scanned it. It's crazy. You had that technology back then. Scanned it. It was an image of it. It was right there on the Word document. I learned how to do that. Even today, we mail out our Christmas cards. 
like, listen, it's just, I'm going to just say it honestly. Susan's amazing at a lot of things. Spreadsheets and Word, mail merges, not her thing, but it's my thing. So every year I just do it. I take care of it. It's my job because I learned it there. I can figure it out. Work hard. Work hard. Do extra. Make yourself, this is what I tell every person that comes and works with us, make yourself indispensable. I told, remember I told this to Brian Holt when he first got his job here. I said, make yourself indispensable. Then he got an opportunity to do some stuff for Central Church, for Big Harvest. And I said, make it so that they would have a terrible time finding your replacement. Now, at this point in my life, it's like I don't try to make myself indispensable because that's not a good way to lead a church. If something happened to me, the church has to continue. So you want to have other pastors, other people. Like, no person is literally indispensable. But make it feel like they couldn't operate without you. Work hard, young people. Do the extra things that are required of you, like the ant. Like the ant. And then then a fourth lesson I've learned. Have a vision. Use your connections. Work hard. Learn, learn, learn. And I had this also. Learn, 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 and learn some more. I already told you about these things. The databases, the mail merges, everything that you have, you can learn. You can learn, even when you hate it, even when it's difficult. I learned how to talk to difficult people, which helped me in my job here. I'm just kidding. They all left. All the difficult people left. (laughs) Totally kidding. But I learned how to talk to people on the phone, customer service, right? I think the fact that I am in the lobby and able to talk to people and recognize people, I think all of those things are things that I learned in every job that I have up till now. I had this reminder um, when I was going through Exodus, and in Exodus, we see the people of Israel leaving Egypt. They're going to the promised land. They could have gotten there in just a week's time, but God took them on this journey 40 years wilderness, then another 40 years, right? It's struggle. It's a pain. It's challenging. But God was preparing the people for the place. The wilderness wasn't the final destination, but in the wilderness is where the preparation happens. I'm going to quote John Collado. We have this meeting on uh, Wednesdays where we go through my sermon and just kind of go through And uh, John, I'm going to quote him right now. This is what John says. We are looking for the perfect job, but God is looking to perfect us. We're always looking for the perfect job, but God is looking to perfect you. He wants to make a kind of person who may get to do the kinds of things that they like, but they may not. But will you still do the things that you hate as unto the Lord for the glory of God, the glory of God in my work? I hope you're understanding this is very clear from the word of God that God wants us to work. Because of their foolishness and disobedience, the people of Israel wandered, but they learned to trust the Lord in the wilderness. Hard work, it's what's wise and commended by God. But next here, finally, as we develop our theology of work, I think it's important to consider the kinds of things that you should be doing for work, the kinds of things you should be setting your heart and minds to. Finally, the best work for you is what you do well. The best work for you is what you do well. I had a thought to call, say it like this. Some of you are like, you don't even care. You forget all these things. But for me, this is part of the art. It's part of what I love about my job is I get to do this. I get to create. I wanted to say the best work for you is what you do best. I was like, you know what? Maybe, yeah, that's true. But I want to give you some opportunity to even do some things that you do well may not be the best thing you do, but it's stuff you do well. Before we talk about this, I understand that some of you are in jobs that you must do. You got to pay the bills. You, you have to make ends meet. You know, when we got back from this serving opportunity, Matt Van Tynan had gave this testimony, used this language. He said that some people that they were ministering to at Love, Inc., when they went up to Waukegan or Gurney, he said they're on like the razor's edge between not being able to make it. They got to catch a bus. You know, if they late to work, they could lose their job. And so I understand some of you must do what you're doing. And you got to keep doing it as unto the Lord. But if you're working in a place that you think is not really your best or what you do well, you can pray about these things and you can consider, even get some counsel about maybe it's time for you to have a vision for something different. What are you good at doing? What do you do well? What do you bear the most fruit from? Where have you seen your work prosper? 
You know, the best chefs in the world, they have great palates. They know how to taste the food. And when they are cooking, the best chefs, the best restaurants, they are not cooking to please the people. They're cooking because they want it to taste good. But because their palates are so good, it pleases the people. Do what you do well and try to find opportunities for you to do that in every place you go. When we were in Austin for spring break this year, we went to so many restaurants down there. It's like a food town. And we went to this Japanese barbecue fusion place, right? Southern barbecue, Japanese, and every bite was awesome. Even things, sometimes Susan orders things. I'm like, I don't really want to try it. It comes out on a spoon. You're like, all right, I'll just take that one. And it's good because the art and creativity, the way that they do things, they're doing what they do well. And then we get to benefit from it. The world gets to prosper from it. Like a chef, you are uniquely gifted to do some things. You've been given some gifts by God, some talents by God. What do you do well? Try to do that in your work. And I believe you'll have even more fulfillment. Even in your parenting, some of you moms and dads who are working hard at home, you're doing it. You're using your gift. You're good at it. It's what you do well. Even though you got your degree, you're staying at home because it is something that you do well. And so do it as unto the Lord and work hard. But regarding your own work, if you're working for somebody out in the workforce, be uniquely you. Have the wisdom of God to know what God wants you to do and the discipline to stop comparing yourself to other people. Don't compare yourself to everybody else. Just do what you are called to do as good as you can do it, as well as you can do it. That's what God wants. In Exodus chapter 25, here as we're getting ready to close, Exodus 25, after Moses is on the mountain meeting with God for 40 days, God tells Moses to start getting contributions to build the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the place where they would meet with God, where God's presence would be for worship. But there were specific instructions on how to build it. Moses could not be the only one to contribute. And so in Exodus chapter 25, he starts to say, get from the people the contributions. And they start to contribute their linen, their gold, their silver, their bronze, their wood, their oil, their goat skins. For us, we're like, we didn't think any of you had goat skins. And we're not going to use goat skins. So we said, contribute what you have for our building project, your resources, your money, right? This is biblical. This is the way that stuff happens. If you're going to build something, the people need to gather it. And so they... Do it. Moses can't do it alone. The people have to get involved. Moses couldn't build all this by himself. We don't know how good of a builder he was. He grew up in Pharaoh's home, and then he was in the wilderness taking care of sheep. So he's a good shepherd, but maybe not a great builder. Build for me a tabernacle. I don't know how to build it. That's okay. Exodus chapter 31, we see that God is going to provide able men who have ability. Exodus 31 verse 1, it says this, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, son of, Jude, the, tri- of the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Oheliab, the son of Ahizamak, of the tribe of of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability, to all able men ability, to all able women ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. Ability and intelligence, God has given able men, able women ability. Are you able? Do what you can do with what God has given you. Are you an able man? Are you an able woman? Do you have an ability? Use it. Use it for God's glory in whatever work that you are called to do. Now, we're not just talking about what you're passionate about doing. Some people are like, I'm just trying to find the job that I'm passionate about doing. But it's not just what you're passionate about doing. There's a lot of professions. I'm not going to name them here, but a lot of professions that they have to do stuff that they're not passionate about doing, like cleaning a clogged sewer, a plumber, I doubt a plumber is passionate about that, but they're good at it. And so they do it. Able men abilities. They're not passionate about it, but they're good at it. And so they do it. And hopefully if you're a 
Christian plumber, you do it as unto the Lord. If you're not careful, especially you younger ones here, you'll do what Cal Newport, I referenced him earlier, deep work. Well, Cal Newport calls the passion trap. The passion trap. The passion trap is this. Well, first, people have this passion hypothesis. It actually started with an Episcopal priest in San Francisco. This idea of do what you're passionate about. What, what they found in the studies is if you just focus on what you're passionate about, Cal Newport talks about this, if you focus on only what you're passionate about, you're going to be discouraged at work because you don't, even in your work, you're going to have to do mundane things. You're going to have to do things that are not so, you're not crazy about. So if, you're, if your goal or your expectation is the job is just going to be passionate all the time, you're going to be disappointed. And this is what Cal Newport calls the passion trap. It's this, the more emphasis you place on finding the work you love, the more unhappy you become because when you don't love every minute of the work you have. So don't just try and be fulfilled with your passions at work. It could leave you disappointed. When you work, do what you do, 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 what you do well. Find jobs like that. And maybe, just maybe, like me, I feel like I found that. I have a job I'm passionate about, and I'm able to do it. And when those two things meet, it is very sweet, but it may be rare. And if you don't have that, keep doing what you're doing and pray about maybe God would give you that opportunity. Our worship team is going to come out in a moment right now and get prepared. We're going to have communion as we close. But the best work for you is the work you do well. The Lord is satisfied in our work, not our perfection. I think even as we remember the Lord here, we're reminded that we are not perfect, but God does a work that perfects us. Our worship team, I hope they'll come out soon. <laughs> the, we are not perfect, but then we appear as perfect. If you're in a community group, since I have a little time, I'll just talk to you. <laughs> the community group, if you're in a community group, I think it's important for you to be able to um, know what your community group is struggling with. Know what they're facing. Know what kinds of things that they're going through so you can minister to them. I think that's the case in our community group. We know what people are working. We know what they're going through. We can hold them accountable. We can help them. Have other people around that can help you. And I hope these messages on work are encouraging for you. If you look at your notes, you notice there's a point four. It's not because I ran out of time. This week, I actually said, I'm like, I'm going to wait till next week. Next week's message already has a title. And it's this, work as worship. Work as worship. Well, let's uh, just prepare uh, for receiving our...